Good morning. It's great to be with you all. I ask that you turn me in your Bibles to Psalm 38. That'll be the first passage for consideration this morning. Some of you may not know this about me, but I am an asthmatic. And uh, whenever I was younger, my asthma would give me a whole lot of trouble. My asthma would really bother me. And I remember one occasion uh, as probably the worst asthma attack I've ever had. Uh, it was in 2010. I was 13 years old. And uh, I was actually getting ready to go to the uh, church annex because at the church annex, I was going to receive a certificate of completion for a course in the Fishers of Men program. And uh, on that day, whenever I was getting ready, you know, I got dressed, I was looking for my shoes, and immediately, you know how asthma attack goes, it feels like you get the wind knocked out of you. You can't breathe, it seems like no matter how hard you try, no air is getting in. It seems like uh, it's hopelessness is what it's, it seems like. And uh, I remember uh, whenever the asthma attack set in, I just began to panic, began to look and try to find my inhaler. And, uh, you know, at the time I was using two different inhalers, uh, one depending on how serious the, the, the asthma issue was. Uh, one was my rescue inhaler, the other was an over-the-counter inhaler. So I began looking for either one of these. I figured, okay, so the over-the-counter, you know, that's, that's, that's for small issues, but it'll give me some ease, right? So I began looking for that, and I go, man, all I got is a, is a mouthpiece. So I, I had that mouthpiece in my hand, so I'm looking for my prescription inhaler. And I, I mean, this just tells you, a 13-year-old Cody was a slob, the fact that he can't find two different inhalers. He, he had a mouthpiece, and, and so I began looking for my, uh, my prescription inhaler. And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, all I can find is the cartridge, or a cartridge. And so I go, okay, so I got these two. So I go to put them together, well, they don't fit, right? Two different inhalers, two different uh, molds, and so I gotta figure out how am I going to make this work? So here I am in a panic. I don't know what I looked like, but I would like to think that I had a blue face and everything. It felt like that. So I go to the kitchen and I go, here's my idea. I'm going to cut down this mouthpiece so that I can put the, the cartridge in there and be able to use it. So I do that. I take a knife and I, I took a, a steak knife. I began back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And just with, with the asthma weighing on me, my anxiety going through the roof, my hand slipped and I cut my finger. Real deep, real deep, bad. And we super glued it together after the blood uh, kind of uh, ceased a little bit, but it is a real bad cut. And it's a cut, it's a scar that I have on my finger now that every time I look at my hand, I can remember how awful that asthma attack was. I can remember uh, my thoughts whenever I cut my finger. I was like, seriously, another thing right now? Um, as my mom started treating this, I can remember her telling me uh, how, uh, we'll use another term, how foolish I was. <laughs> and um, I remember thinking in my head, well, we need to hurry up with this because I still need to cut my mouthpiece so I can get breathing. Well, my stepdad finished up the mouthpiece for me and handed it to me. And I did that while my mom was treating my finger. And then I went to the Fishers of Men program. I can remember everything about that 30 minutes or so, that everything, it was probably more like five minutes, but everything that I can remember, every detail about that. Now, some of you, you have scars. You know, they say if you don't have scars, you haven't lived. And so you have scars that you can look at and you can say, oh, this is what happened with, with this. I know uh, if you want to hear some scar stories, go ahead and ask Chris. He has scars all over him. <laughs> And he has all sorts of stories behind those scars, some of them entertaining, some of them really make you feel bad for them. Um, but, you know, everybody has scars. Everybody knows that scars tell a story. And as we know, um, one of the things about scars, especially, is that scars aren't always physical, right? Scars aren't always physical. They can be spiritual things. They can be emotional things. Scars have an ability to show themselves just as much inwardly as they do outwardly. And so what I want us to do this morning is look at uh, scars, to think about scars and to learn from them and see what it is that they remind us. They remind us, number one, that sin is painful. Scars remind us that sin is painful. 
Uh, when we look at scars, again, we can remember the pain. I can remember vividly the pain uh, of cutting my finger. You can remember vividly the pain of some of those scars that are on your body. And that's because scars serve as a reminder of painful events. And that is certainly true spiritually. All of us have sinned. And if sin doesn't make you hurt, if sin doesn't bring you pain, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble because you ought to be pained by your sins. If it doesn't pain you, you're not where you need to be. When we recall the sinful uh, events of our lives, it should bring back painful memories. Sin isn't just something that we can brush off. It isn't something light. It isn't something that we can treat as if it's not a big deal. You know, sometimes you might um, come across people who, who brag about their sins. Have you ever come across someone who brags about their sins? I'll tell you right now, that's a, that's a disgusting thing. Uh, these people, whenever they brag about their sins, they're, they're not coming and saying, you know, I've done this. It's not a confession. It's not saying I've done this. This is what I learned from it. This is what I want you to know from it because I don't want you to repeat my mistakes. But some people, they just really, they, they brag about their sins. They brag proudly about their former sins. And that's because they don't feel any pain. They don't feel any pain for what they have done. It seems as if they have no remorse. It definitely seems as if there has been no genuine repentance. You remember what Paul said about genuine repentance? He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 that godly grief produces repentance that leads to life. Godly grief. We ought to be grieved. We ought to be grieved in the same ways that God is grieved. God is grieved by lying. God is grieved by fornication. God is grieved by alcoholism. He is grieved by stealing. And, and you could fill in the blank of all the sinful activities that we know people brag about that God is grieved by. That certainly should not be us. If we are going to be godly, we need to be grieved by our sins. When the godly sin, they are broken by it. When David confessed his sins, we don't see a bragging man. We see a man who was weeping on rock bottom. Look here at Psalm 38 and verse 18. Psalm 38 and verse 18, he says, I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. The New King James Version says that I am anguished. I will be anguished by my sins. You remember all the times where David is pleading to God to have mercy on him? I think about Psalm 51 when David had committed that sin with Bathsheba. He comes before God in Psalm 51 in prayer and he's begging. He, he is seeking God earnestly to forgive him. He says, wash me and purge me with hyssop. And he even says in that psalm that the things which God respects, the thing that God desires isn't sacrifice. He says, if it was sacrifice, I would have given it to you by the ten thousands. It's not sacrifice. It's a broken and contrite spirit. A broken heart. Oh God, you will not despise. We ought to be broken by our sins because our sins, our sins are a painful reminder of what we have done in transgression to God. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 27, it says, Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Can you sin and it not hurt you? Again, if you don't feel the same anguish for sins like David did or like Jesus did in the garden for sins that weren't even his own, sins that weren't even his own, Jesus wept and he, 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 he sweated teardrops of blood, sweated blood, great anxiety over sin. If you do not feel that, then you fall into a category of people which Paul spoke about uh, concerning the Gentiles. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 19, that have become callous to sin. They're past the point of feeling. And of course, there Paul uses Gentiles symbolically to represent those who are ungodly. If we're not stricken by sin, we are ungodly. And so uh, something to keep in mind, you know, in our, especially in our culture, you have machoism as a forefront, uh, perhaps to keeping men back from true repentance. 
we need to keep in mind that there have been much mightier men, much stronger men than you and I that have melted into anguish because of their sins. It's not a weak thing. In fact, it is a godly thing. It's a strong thing. You think about David. God described David. Why was David not allowed to build the temple of God? Because he was a man of war. His hands were covered in blood. David, uh, he defeated lions and all those many things with, with various handheld weapons. You and I have done that. You and I have done that. David's a much mightier man than you and I, and he melted in anguish because of his sins. Again, scars remind us that sin is painful. A second thing that scars remind us, and we can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, is that we don't want to repeat the same mistakes. Scars remind us that we don't want to repeat the same mistakes. When I look at my hand, I don't want to make that same mistake. I want to first make sure that I have my inhaler available at all times. I want to make sure that all my inhalers match so that there is complete functionality. I don't want to have to make shift one. I don't want to have to risk that any, any longer. I don't want to ever be in that same situation and try and replicate what I had attempted. And that right there, looking at this scar and saying that I don't want to do that again, is what Paul's talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let's begin in verse 6. He says, Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Verse 7, Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose to play. We must, verse 8, not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. That's talking about the events in Numbers chapter 25 at Baal Peor. Uh, verse 9, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and, destroy, and, and were destroyed by serpents. Interesting there because that... Uh, the event which he's talking about here actually doesn't refer to Christ the person, right? It refers to Moses the person. The people of Israel rebelled against Moses, uh, but you see here, you disrespect God's messenger, you disrespect God. Uh, verse 10, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of ages has come. Paul here was talking about the Israelites. He was talking about their sins. He was talking about learning from their mistakes. What did the Israelites do? Well, they lusted after evil things, verse 6. Did that get them far? Absolutely not. Does Paul say to do that same thing? Absolutely not. They practiced idolatry, verse 7. Uh, where did that get them? They got them into captivity. Paul says, don't do that. That won't get you very far. Verse 8, they practice sexual immorality. Paul says again, don't do that. That's not going to get you very far. Verse 10, they complain. Don't do that. That's not going to get you very far. These things didn't get them very far. These, these things, uh, actually, they got them nowhere good. We know from our studies in the prophets uh, that this led to them uh, being destroyed. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I have rejected you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten my law, uh, the law of your God, I also will forget your children. It, it didn't get them very far. We mentioned in Bible class this morning, 2 Chronicles 36 verses 15 and 16, they, their sin problem got them to a point in which there was no remedy. There's nothing that they could do to redeem themselves from their wickedness. And so God punished them. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13, Isaiah says, Therefore my people go into exile for lack of knowledge. They go into exile for lack of knowledge. These things happened, and these things were recorded so that we could look at them, so we can look at the scars of Israel and say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. As parents, I'm not a parent, but as parents, have you ever used scars as an example? As parents, have you 
ever pulled your children aside and said, you see that? That is why we don't do that. You see the effect that alcohol has had on him? And that's why we don't drink alcohol. That's why God says, be sober-minded. We, we, we can look at people and we can, see, we can say, uh, you see what lust did to their marriage? That's why God commands us to put away those former lusts. As parents, you've probably said stuff like that. As parents, you've probably looked at the scars of other people and have used them to teach your children not to do the same thing. And in fact, it would be negligent of us not to do that. Some folks have scars, and some folks' scars are lasting. Nearly every one of us could think of a family that, that has scars because the parents decided that they were going to take a spiritual hiatus, that they weren't going to be faithful to God. And, and you know, if there comes a time where those parents, they come back, right? But you look at their children, and their children are off in the world. Their children are, are indulging in all sorts of, of wickedness, all sorts of sin. And the reason why is because godliness was never taught in the home when it should have been taught in the home. Uh, you think about it, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. That, that is building a foundation. And many families have scars because they didn't build that foundation. Because as parents, they didn't show a love for God. And so their, their children have grown up not loving God. Some scars, uh, uh, some scars are very deep. And scars are something uh, that really I'm sure we would all love to go back and keep from having. Uh, I could have gone my whole life without putting my finger. That would have been great. Um, I think about spiritual scars. You know, there's a lot of things in life that I've done, that you've done, that we could, we would think I could have gone my whole life without ever knowing that. And it's taught me a valuable lesson, but I could have gone my whole life not knowing that lesson. Uh, and I think about, in making this point, I think about the man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he was committing fornication with his father's wife. And this was certainly a shameful thing. In fact, Paul said that the Gentiles don't even do that. The Gentiles don't even do such a thing. But how, how did that man handle his scars after his repentance? Surely he was embarrassed, right? Perhaps that's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 regarding that man. He says, now that he's repented... You ought to build that brother up. You ought to make sure that he knows he is forgiven and that he has salvation. Scars can be deeply embarrassing and they are hard to move past mentally. But they, uh, but they do well in reminding us not to make the same mistakes again. The third thing that we learn from scars. Scars remind us that healing doesn't remove them. We'll be looking at Galatians 6 and verse 7 to make this point. You can get right with God, but that doesn't mean that the principles get put on hold. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, you reap what you sow. If you sow to the flesh and then you seek repentance, uh, uh, and then seek repentance, and exp uh, you cannot expect to, to reap according to the Spirit. You can't uh, be, you can't certainly uh, or rather, you can certainly be forgiven by God, but those scars are still going to appear on your body, right? If I commit a crime, and the punishment for that crime is, is jail, right? Well, if I repent, does my jail time get revoked? No, of course not. Uh, we understand that. You can't live your life as a drunk, become diagnosed with a corrosive liver, and expect for repentance to reverse that disease. You can't, uh, you just simply can't do that. There are people who are for, or who are penitent and they are forgiven, but they still carry the scars of their decisions on them, and that makes life really hard. In Proverbs 13 and verse 15, it says, the way of the transgressor is hard. Uh, people want to portray sin as pleasure and harmless fun in which people don't get hurt, and that's simply wrong. People get hurt every time. The family gets broken by adultery, 
and that hurts. The woman, uh, she gets broken when she aborts her child. You know, people want to say, you know, it's a good life decision. Keeps everything fine for now. Further studies see that these women they struggle with depression afterwards. They're hurt. They're hurt over taking the innocent life. There is deep pain that surrounds sin and its consequences. And we must remember that just because you are forgiven doesn't mean that you are free of any scars. The things that we do impact us for the rest of our lives. Let's look here at a fourth lesson from John chapter 21. Turn over there with me. John 21. Scars remind us that we aren't useless. We've got scars on our body, but that does not mean that our scars or that our bodies don't work. I've got the scar on my finger, but it still works fine. You might have a scar on your head and your head works fine. You might have a scar on your foot and your foot works fine. Scars don't mean that whatever is scarred becomes useless. I, whenever I think at this point, I think of Peter. Uh, Peter had scars. Peter had great spiritual scars. He said he would go to death in prison for Christ. And whenever he was given an opportunity to prove himself, he denied him three times. He denied Christ, uh, and, and, and after which Peter and Jesus, they locked eyes, remember, and Peter broke down and he wept bitterly. He wept bitterly because of the great mistake that he knew he had done. As far as we see in Scripture, something interesting about that is that uh, that was the last time that Peter saw Jesus before his death. And, uh, you know, we fast forward to Jesus being resurrected out of the tomb. And, and uh, in Mark chapter 16 and verse 7, uh, you find something very interesting. You know, Jesus is resurrected out of the tomb. And the angel is standing there. And, you know, he tells, the, he tells Mary, he says, I want you to go, go tell them. Mark 16 and verse 7, he says, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Why did he single out Peter? Perhaps he knew that Peter was feeling useless. Perhaps he knew that, that Peter remembered those scars. He remembered vividly that moment whenever, whenever he said, I do not know the, this man of whom you speak. And then turning behind, looked and saw Jesus. He remembered those tears. And because of those tears, Peter felt useless. Peter wasn't useless. Jesus uh, made sure that he understood that. We look here in John chapter 21. Look here at verses 15 through 19. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the, the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Which he said, to show by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Three times Jesus asked, do you love me? Feed my sheep. There was still a use for Peter. And Peter accomplished great things for the kingdom in his life. Peter preached the first gospel message at Pentecost that resulted in the salvation of 3,000 souls. Peter preached another time in Acts chapter 4, which resulted in the salvation of souls. In Acts chapter 5, Peter was out of prison, 
And he stood boldly for the Lord, and he told the scribes and Pharisees, and said, You are no longer to preach. He said, You decide for yourselves. Do I listen to God, or do I listen to you? Peter was bold. Peter did great things. Peter, we learn from 1 Peter chapter 5, was an elder in the church, accomplished many great things. But if he rolled up his sleeves, he could show you his scars. He rolled up his sleeves to show you his arms. I think about another individual in scripture. I think about John Mark. Remember John Mark? He deserted Paul and Barnabas in a missionary journey. And that's why in Acts chapter 15, you have Paul and Barnabas. They're conferring. They're ready to go on a mission. And they go, okay, who are we going to bring with us? And Barnabas says, well, we'll bring John Mark. Well, Paul says, absolutely not. We're not bringing John Mark. He deserted us. We are not taking him with us. And so there arose this great contention between the two, between uh, Paul and Barnabas. And, and so you imagine being John Mark, right? John Mark, you go, okay, I, I know Barnabas, he's helping me, but Paul, man, Paul doesn't see anything in me. Paul thinks I'm useless. Paul actually thinks I would actually work against the gospel. Paul later says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, he says, get Mark and bring him with you, talking to Timothy, for he is very useful to me for ministry. He is very useful for ministry. John Mark had a scar. He had a great scar. He deserted the mission field. He deserted two, two labors of the gospel in the mission field. But he was useful. He ended up being useful. I think about Onesimus. Onesimus, he stole from his master Philemon. And you remember what Paul says to Philemon? Paul is writing that whole book as an appeal for Philemon to take him back. And he says in verse 11, he says, He who was formerly useless to you is now useful. He is useful. We need to be thinking about ourselves. We have scars, deep scars, but we're useful. We are useful, as Paul says, being epistles of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. We are useful, as Christ says, as the salt of the earth, Matthew 5, 13. We are useful, as Christ says, as the, as the light to the world, Matthew 5 and verse 14 through 16. We are useful, as Paul says, as the bulwark of truth, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And we are useful, as Christ says, to be makers of disciples, Matthew 28, verse 19. We are useful as fishers of men. You are more than useful. You are treasured by God. You are treasured by God, and we can see that in the fact that he has sent his son for you, John 3, 16, that he has blessed you richly with grace, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and verse 9, and that he protects you by his hand, John 10, and verse 29, so that none can reach him and snatch you away. Every scar tells a story. They can provide us hope. They can serve as a reminder. They aren't to serve as an excuse. Our scars should never be an excuse as to why we cannot serve the Lord. We can still be useful for Him in spite of our many mistakes. Some people, uh, they look at scars and they, they always align them with, with the negative, right? And some scars are truly negative. Some scars are just born out of foolishness. But some scars are born out of love. You know, uh, a mother might have a scar because she was taking care of her child. A, uh, I think about the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 17. He says, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Those are physical marks that he retold in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 through 26. Marks that were caused by being whipped 39 times on five different occasions. Marks that were caused by being stoned. Marks that were being that were caused by, uh, by being beaten, as Paul says, countlessly. Countlessly I was beaten. Beaten with rods on three different occasions. I heard a preacher say, say this about what Paul's saying. He goes, I want you to imagine you have this man tied to a post you got your whip ready. You're the fifth man to give Paul 39 lashes. You take the shirt off his back. 
and you see scars. What goes through your mind? Surely a person in that situation goes, what kind of man is this? Who is this? That's a man that loves his Savior. That's a man that loves his Lord. Those scars weren't born out of foolishness. Those scars were born out of love. I think about Christ. You know, Christ came and he presented himself to Thomas. And what did Thomas want to see? Thomas wanted to see the scars. What do those scars symbolize? That scar on his ribs, the scar on his, on his hands and on his feet, the scar where the crown had, had been smushed. Those represented love, an undying love. We too can bear scars that are indications of our love. We can bear scars that show that we have loved the Lord more than family. Perhaps our family have turned their back on us because of our faith. We can show scars that, that prove that we are more concerned with pleasing God than pleasing men because we've lost many friends. We, we can have scars of maybe from a time in which we made a decision in favor of godliness and we were the only ones standing. Those scars we can bear proudly because we know that we've received them and suffering for our Lord. My encouragement this morning is for us to learn from scars, for us not to make the same mistakes which we have, and for us to also learn to bear proudly those that are born for Christ. Now here in a moment, uh, we're going to have a, a song sung, and, and the song is, Are You Washed in the Blood? And when we think about the songs, often we think about baptism, right? Our mind often goes to baptism. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And certainly, if you're not baptized, if you have that desire to be baptized, understand that's the only way for salvation. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there's no other name given, on, given among men by which we are saved. Uh, John, or Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. That that way through, that door, as Jesus described himself in John chapter 10, is baptism. Uh, Paul, Paul makes that sure in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Uh, another way that we need to be thinking about this song, maybe you haven't thought about it this way, but think about this. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, it tells us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of his Son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. What is that contingent upon? It's contingent upon walking in the light as he is in the Lord. So are you washed in the blood? Are you following him? Are you walking with him each day? Those are things I challenge you to think about. This morning, if there is anything that we could do for you, anyone in need of prayers, anyone in need of study, uh, any, any sort of thing, please come and make that known. Let's together we stand and as we sing.